So I promised a few of you a story, uh, and I was inspired this by Dee Jepson yesterday in an absolutely wonderful workshop in uh, which uh, she was talking about working with the Amish and in a particular situation of dealing with snowplows. And the story is sort of our farewell message to you from Minnesota. And if you're like me, planning to be in Saskatoon next October, maybe a a good lesson about the weather. But there's a fellow named Mark Mayfield who is a, a part of the speakers network, a former national FFA officer. We use him to speak to our young farmer program as part of our annual meeting each year. And he always tells this wonderful story about what it's like going from Kansas up into the further Midwest and anticipating winter. And the way he tells the story is that when he was young and uh, just setting out in his career, he was planning a trip into Minnesota in the winter and was worried about the weather, so he asked his father for advice. And the advice was simple. If you find yourself out on a country road in a blizzard, heavy snow, what you do is you get behind a snowplow and just follow it. You'll be fine. So he said, sure enough, he was in southern Minnesota, got caught in a blizzard, remembered his father's advice, saw a snowplow, got behind it, and followed it, and followed it, and followed it. After a lengthy period of time, the driver stopped, came back, and tapped on his window and said, are you okay? And Mark said, yeah, I'm fine. And the driver said, what are you doing? And he relayed his father's advice about following a snowplow. And then he asked the driver, where are we anyway? And the driver said, well, we finished Walmart, and then we went to Home Depot, and now I'm at Menards. <laughs> so <clears throat> it gets like that here. Um, I would like to, you know, I, we must be the only occupation that has this tendency to share the personal stories in the way we, that we do. But I think it's really important that we do. Um, it may sound self-indulgent, but I doubt if there are any, I know that there aren't any of us who don't have a personal story. Yesterday I was reminded when Neil Conklin showed the picture of Cole Gustafson, who had been the head of Ag Econ at North Dakota State University. I'd been on the phone with Cole a week before that, working on a major project that we were both excited about. And then I heard the, the tragic news of his death. And uh, it took many, many months before we got back on track with NDSU, but I can only imagine the tragedy at NDSU and the family. In my own case, I grew up on a farm about 120 miles north of here, and uh, I was reminded several times of a, a situation that happened to me that turned out okay, but I'll, I just want to illustrate it um, in part because of many of the things that we've heard. But one of the most exciting days of my life was when my father told me I would get to drive our Super C tractor for the first time. I was in fourth grade. I don't know how old you are then, but I, I didn't flunk, so I'm whatever age I was supposed to be. It was a wide front Super C. The training I got was that there were two things I needed to know, the clutch and the brake, and you always step on the clutch first. So we were out, headed out to a field which long before mapping became concerned, we referred to it as the hillside field, which it was an entire deeply sloped uh, field. And as I turned a corner, I was losing control, and I couldn't reach both the clutch and the brake, so I stepped on the clutch, which only made the situation worse. My father ran alongside, got up on the drawbar, and was able to stop the tractor about 10 feet short of about a 60-foot embankment. And if you can imagine the conversation around the dinner table that night, it was this, nothing. Uh, no conversation about what happened, what should have been done differently, and, and we went on, and today, uh, my brothers and sisters are all farmers, a lot of siblings, and I know that they aren't always as safety conscious as they should be. I think um, we had an Uncle Raymond who was on a 60 John Deere going down a Hawaii highway, um, holding on to the fender, standing on the drawbar, hit a bump, he went over, the tractor went over him, he survived. My brother Ron got his arm in a corn picker, uh, my 
50-some-year-old sister last year when we were on a conference call for the ASHCA planning summit, I got an email saying that she had, uh, from one of my sisters, saying that she had mistakenly un not done what she should have done with the steer loader. It crashed on her. She's still, six months later, uh, recovering from it. When we were kids, my brother Ed, while I was standing next to him, decided to pee on an electric fence. It was not pretty. Technically, I shouldn't say that was an accident because he did it on purpose, but I don't recommend it. Seriously, uh, we're, we are exposed, and this summer, in about a five-week period, we had an intern, and um, I just had her kind of track the media for a while, and there's just a series of these. This happened within about a, a five-week period, I think, in June. And we quit, we quit tracking them, but there were a lot, and these were all children. And so I was really pleased to hear the USDA announcement the other day about the new initiative and working with Penn State and other universities. I, I think it's really important. And as I go into the slides that I had prepared for the topic that I'm to address, uh, I just want to raise the, the point. There are questions. We don't know the answers yet. And we prepared the questions thinking about where might we be at this point in the summit. Uh, there have been things that have, have come up around sustainability, water reduction, local foods, next generation, et cetera. And one of the points that I want to make and highlight is I think many of us, uh, many of you really, and I, I, who are ag safety professionals, probably got into the profession much the way that I got into philanthropy and corporate citizenship. I too, I started out in the university. I work in the field now in corporate giving, but I nor most of my colleagues ever were trained in this. You sort of get there from somewhere else. And I think one of the things that we need to be conscious of in the future is starting to work with um, college students to help them plan for careers, in part because there's so much that needs to be done and we can't just rely on hoping that we stumble into it as, as I did and maybe some of you did. So with that, let me just go through um, a series of questions. Again, the point of the summit was to simply say, we've got a big challenge and opportunity ahead of us in agriculture to feed and provide energy to uh, 9 billion people uh, by 2050. So uh, I would offer that we have the opportunity to meet the challenge in ways that are safe, humane, and sustainable. It's gonna require public-private partnerships we have an opportunity to make a lasting impact to those who produce our food. And there have been and will be even greater strides in technology and natural resource conservation. And we must be equally dedicated to conserving ag's human resources. ASHCA is, uh, was an organization, as you know, started a little over five years ago, uh, trying to look at the big picture. I'll close with a comment about that. We're very much aware of ag industrialization and global trade. The well-being of a workforce to feed the world's population is a theme that's come up again and again. And I think, as we've said many, many times in this conference, there isn't any one organization that's going to be able to do it all. And I appreciate just the preceding uh, conversation about the Go uh, Grain Handlers Group and the coalition. And we've been hearing that constantly, and these organizations will continue, and one of the purposes of the summit was to help people get to know others. I, I have to admit, I had never heard of the, the RCM group, but uh, it's changed my life. I can say that, and I'm gonna look at immigration in a whole different way, and we really appreciate what all of the different organizations are doing. Uh, there was an article published in the Agri-Medicine Editorial some months ago about uh, what led to the summit. If you haven't looked at that, we'd encourage you now after the summit to go back and and take a look at it. But here are some questions that uh, I would raise to think about whether or not we've addressed them at the summit, and I'm not going to say that we've addressed all of them, hopefully some of them, but what does it portend for the future? Uh, Evidence-based strategies, practices for eliminating the major and most costly injured injuries, diseases among agricultural workers. We've heard many times that this isn't a pure science but you really need to aim for as much 
perfection as you can. Each life lost is, is really important. Uh, different strategies for large operations uh, and for small farms. Uh, what is our role in safety, safely producing, processing, and distributing food for an anticipated nine billion people? Uh, you know, I, I, at least I was reminded again of the, the different phases of agriculture, whether it's in the, in the planning, the harvesting, the processing, the marketing, uh, food safety at the other end are all parts of a very complex enterprise. Uh, the global market and shrinking economy, how does it affect our standards? How do we effectively guide food production and worker safety in developing countries? What should our research priorities be and who will pay for the research? What infrastructure is most appropriate to ensure research capacity, relevance, and translation into practice? One of the things that we tried to do at the summit, and you'll need to be the judge of whether we succeeded, was to build a blend of uh, demonstrating best practices and examples in the workshops, in the videos, and also challenge our overall broader thinking. Because we need to do both, uh, one without the other will prove inadequate. Who are, where is the next generation of agricultural safety health specialists, advocates, practitioners, researchers? I, I think many of us, and we heard this over and over again, we're motivated by things that happen in our own lives. Hopefully, we will see uh, more professionals entering the field who are doing it not because of something that personally happened to them, but because they personally care. What are the educational systems needed to secure succession of current leaders in agricultural safety? What is the role of agribusinesses and related industries? For example, insurance, banking, legal, ensuring responsibility for safety of food and workers. David Dar's uh, presentation this morning, I think, was a good wake-up call for all of us about what is happening in the world of sustainability and its connection to corporate social responsibility. And as I indicated yesterday, there is a definite role and important function that ag safety needs to play in that, that effort. What is the role for federal, state policies and regulations? And what is the role of ASHCA as an advocate in public funded, publicly funded programs? How could farm organizations use their operational policies to achieve greater safety and health in agriculture. What is our role in facilitating and sustaining an agricultural workforce, including immigrant workers? How do we effectively reach underserved populations with best safety practices? And how do we effectively safeguard everyone, including children working, visiting, and living on farms? And I think uh, we've, we've heard a lot about that. How do mainstream agricultural safety and health principles fit with growing business such as biofuel production as well as popular trends of urban gardens and local food sales, for example, farmers markets. Should we ad address occupational, safe and healthy for those workers? How do we get the right information to the right people to do the right thing at the right time? How can new communication technologies improve efficiencies in safety practices? What special approaches may be needed to assure the safety and health of vulnerable workers such as youth and migrants, or as in the case that Bill Fields talked about, maybe uh, inequitable uh, standards and procedures in our society. So we've conducted the summit, we're coming near the end, and um, as I switch to my, my closing points here and, and adding a, a few personal comments, uh, just to raise a couple of questions. Uh, we've heard a lot about co-ops. I work for a farmer-owned co-op, 360,000 members, and we think it's a good model. I just point this out that some co-ops suck. <laughs> Help me out here. No, actually, there is a, a point behind this. Um, we moved to St. Paul, East St. Paul, about five years ago, and this actually was a business just a few blocks from our house. I was really curious about it and went over, and I noticed that it had not been operating for a while, and get this, you peered through the window and there was, there was dust on the vacuum cleaners. Isn't that ironic, huh? It's sort of like, what do you do with a garbage can? You want to throw it away. You put it out on the curb, but it, it always stays there. But the point on this is, this company 
was probably formed at a time when there was a need for it. In the Twin Cities, we also had a co-op printing, a central purchasing for office supplies. They no longer exist. They're no longer needed. The broader question for us is around economics. And uh, I was really glad that Bill Field talked about what he did today because there is an economic measure behind what we do, but I think we need to grow it in every dimension. It's a global issue, obviously. Um, even, um, even if you start looking at the ramifications of growing food in other countries, of which many of our US companies are, are getting involved in, uh, it's at the local level, the economics of it. But there's a huge band in between, which in my world includes working with nonprofits, it includes working with universities, uh, trade associations and all of that, uh, membership organizations. Um, Deb Atwood mentioned uh, working with private foundations as well as being an advocacy group. We need to be thinking about all of those things because I think while our overall economy will keep evolving however it will, and despite what's going on in Washington, for those of us from the U.S., we will survive and do that. But I think, again, speaking from my vantage point, um, as a funder, we have to be really meticulous about thinking about how we make sure the funding is available, whether it's for keeping organizations going or, as Bill Field again mentioned, the, the amount of money it's cost in uh, damages and lawsuits compared to what we've invested in, in safety education and training and prevention. I think also uh, looking at the next generation, whether it's uh, diverse students coming into agriculture, or traditional students or whatever, how are, we, how are we supporting them? How do we get them to conferences like this? How do we do that? So I, I really want to emphasize the importance of economics, but do it in a way that you know, we don't get too um, immersed with it in the sense that there's this moral and safety issue as well. The other, uh, another comment I would make uh, before I close is, Again, thinking about organizations, and I loved Bill's comments about the um, gumball machine. I have another metaphor I would offer, uh, in something I actually haven't heard anybody talk about here, but quite often it's typical that someone will say, standing up here, I realize I'm speaking or preaching to the choir. We haven't said that, and I, I think that's a good thing, but I would... I would mention a couple of ideas about choirs. And choir members come and go. They, they move away, they, they pass away, they grow old. Sometimes the whole choir disappears. Maybe you're a choir in a church and the numbers decline. And again, thinking of us interested in ag safety as members of choirs. Some choir members may be out of tune and for those of us old enough to remember Andy Griffith episodes, uh, Barney had this lifelong passion to sing in the Mayberry Choir, and he wasn't very good. So they were always kind of finding ways to, to uh, not have his, him be heard. Uh, styles of music change. Um, there may not be enough songbooks to go around, or maybe there are different editions of songbooks or maybe we in the choir might be using totally different songbooks. So I think the point I'm trying to make is that we need to look to the organizations. In our case, and the host of the summit, ASHCA, and there's a slide there. You can learn more about it from our website, and we do hope you'll consider uh, membership in ASHCA. But we need to look across borders. We need to look at national, cultural, gender, diversity issues. And, um, and the future. The question has come up here, will there be another summit? The answer is it depends on, on all of us, including you in the audience and people uh, responding. I think we pulled together this event as a way to, to get us thinking about this. Um, whether or not there will be another summit, I, I don't know, but I would encourage us to I'll go to Saskatoon next October and uh, see where things are and talk about it. 
And I will promise this, in uh, 2050, I will be 99 years old and I will be going to whatever the current version of the summit is and expect to ask the question as a nitty gritty dirt band did, who they will still be around by then, I'm sure. But ain't it great to be part of something so good that's lasted so long? And I think that's the challenge that we as ASHCA, and again, I include all of the partner organizations in that. How do we look at this for the long haul? And finally, as I.F. I. F. Stone said, if you expect to see the final results of your work, you haven't asked a big enough question. And I think that's what we're trying to do at this summit. We appreciate everybody for coming here and participating and uh, looking to look forward to staying in touch. Thank you.